I started playing when I was about oh, 12, 13 years old, 62, 63, 1963. And um, so, you know, we had a, a, a good area. I lived in uh, New Jersey on the east coast of the United States. And there I had a chance to grow up and uh, knowing Roy Buchanan. And he was one of my real big influences. And uh, I knew Pat Martino and uh, just a bunch of local guitar players that were playing around uh, you know, Philadelphia area and, and New Jersey. And along the shore, they always had um, uh, all these bands that would play on the summertime. And there was a band called the Bond and the Hawks, which became the band for Bob Dylan. And I was there playing with Robbie Robertson when I was like 14, 15 years old. So we were, you know, I just started meeting all these things and I was an only child. And I just really loved the guitar. It was like something I could attach to, you know. And so I, I tried to meet all these other guitar players that I could. And I'd ride my bike, you know, 20 miles just so I could go to a club to, to watch uh, somebody play, you know, perform, you know. And then uh, my cousin took me to a place called Dick Lee's outside Camden, New Jersey. And that's where Roy Buchanan was playing with uh, Bob Moore and the Temptations. And it was Roy Buchanan. And the fun thing about watching him is, you know, I'm, I'm 14 years old and they put me behind the bar and the band's playing behind the bar. So I'm up there below and all the, the crowd people are out there in the audience. And uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I'd be watching Roy Buchanan play. And uh, all, the, all these guitar players would be out there with their dads and everything, you know. So Roy would be playing and, you know, the guitar players would be here and he'd start doing these like harmonic things. And he did a song called uh, Sink to Bismarck. And he would do these cool harmonic things. So all these guys were trying to figure out how he got that tone, you know. So when he would start doing it, he would turn like this so they couldn't see the front of his guitar. And all these heads would just lean over in the audience and everything. And I, I thought that was uh, just classic, you know. And he always laughed about that. He said, remember how when I would play and move the guitar, you'd watch all the heads out there move. And I thought that was so neat. And then uh, they took me to a place called Seaside Heights in uh, New Jersey. And I walk in and I hear this band playing, Hello, Captain Mule Skinner Blues. And it was uh, Phil Humphrey and the Fenderman. And they all had blonde, you know, Fender Showman amplifiers with the, the piggyback reverb units, you know. And so seeing that as a little kid, man, it was just amazing. They were playing jazz master and strats and they all blonde key basses and uh, guitars, you know. So for me, it was just phenomenal seeing that. So that was a, a big influence for me, seeing all that. Why don't we take a walk? Yeah, let's, let's go. So anyway, yeah, we'll go look at some guitar. But, you know, being involved in music, for me, it's, it's been a great thing, you know, and uh, having a chance to come over here and play with you guys, you know, and with Phil Emanuel and everything. And Phil and I played together, like, probably got 25 years ago, I guess, over here. You know, they mentioned. In, in Sydney, said. you know, along the, uh, some convention place. And, uh, but, you know, we have so much in common, you know, even though I'm in the States and you're over here, you have a chance to listen to a lot of the people that I grew up listening to, and it's really cool how we can not even be in a band together, but all of a sudden get together and start, start playing, which I think is really 
quite unique, you know. And, and your style is so diverse with everything, with your uh, slide playing and uh, all the acoustic stuff. And I can't even play a 12 string, you know. I mean, I can't. My fingers are so weak, you know. And I use nines on my on my uh, old Telecaster. And the Telecaster, the one I was using uh, last night, is a uh, has like a 56 body and a 59 neck. And the two pickups in it, the bridge pickup, was my prototype JB that I did for Jeff Beck. Sure. And then the next one was called the JM for John Milner, who was a character who was an American graffiti, the moon movie with Ronnie Howard, you know, and uh, I think, uh, so it was just a whole thing. But I built this guitar for Jeff when he did Blow by Blow, and that's where I started, you know, doing a lot more work for Jeff and everything. Well, you've really had a big imprint on, you know, all the history of, of rock guitar on the guitar. Well, it's, I think because everybody knew how much I enjoyed it. Yeah. And then being a, a little player too, and being out there, people know that, hey man, he knows how to understand the pickups and how they should work and everything. And, and it was really good. And, and I've had a chance to work with so many great people, you know. And, and uh, guys over here, like uh, having a chance to work with Tommy Emanuel and my friend Jed Hughes. He's on tour now with Keith Urban, and I've done stuff with Keith Urban, who's from over here, you know, and I used to work for Little River Band all the time, all those guys, and, uh, but I've always loved, like, the music in Australia here. I mean, it's, it's such great talent, you know, and, and it's so hard sometimes being so far away, and I think the record companies today are having, they're, they're, they're doing their, their key people, you know, I mean, how many songs are you going to hear from Elton John or, you know, Stevie Wonder? I mean, they have so many things in the can that have never been released, and, and it's like a sure shot thing with those record companies, with those artists, you know. So a lot of the newer kids out there playing, I always strive to help them get their own tone, you know, instead of sounding, wanting to sound like Eddie Van Halen, you know, sound like yourself, you know, yourself. And, uh, and I think that's really important to have that opportunity, you know, to teach kids and talk to them and everything. And what you're doing with all your shows and stuff that you do, you know, you're you're out there, you're educating, and you're really playing a lot of different styles, and you're influencing a lot of different people, which I think is so great, you know, for what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Boy, well, I, like, just talking to you last night, and, and some of the names of the guitar players that you've actually played with and yeah, worked for, made right, pickups yeah. with, and, yeah, for, good. you know, uh, who was... Uh, who was one that you particularly enjoyed playing with? Well, uh, probably Roy Buchanan. I played with Jeff Beck. Uh, Albert Collins was probably one of my biggest. And I've done a lot of shows with James Burton, uh, Nookie Edwards from The Ventures. You know, I've done shows with them. Uh, there was a band called The Fireballs. They had a, a lot of, they wrote Bulldog and Torque and uh, Quite a Party. And uh, that's uh, uh, George Tomsko. And I actually played in that band, you know. and. And I like touring with the Shirelles and stuff, meeting all these other different guitar players. And but you know those guys are probably the biggest influence. You know, sitting around watching Les Paul play uh, close up and personal. You know, just watching him and showing you how to do things. Wow. So I, I've had so many. I mean, I've been so lucky. You know, to have so many great opportunities. You know, and and all the younger guys. I mean, I played played with George Lynch and uh, Dave Mustaine. You know, all the younger. That's you know uh, Eddie Van Halen. He was a brilliant guitar player. You know he's done so many great things. And uh, uh, Randy Rhodes, guys like that that I grew up you know, watching and listening to and helping him. Uh, a young uh, surf guitar player by the name of Gary Hoey, which uh, he's got. He's probably got 15 albums out in the states. But he came to my booth when he was like 14 years old. And he's like this little kid. And he's just playing all these notes, you know. And uh, and I said, boy, I really like what you're doing, you know. I said, I, I like where you're coming from, you know, and how you're doing that wrist control and everything. And I said, here, you know, I'd love to have you try some of my pickups. And he was so, uh, you know, excited that I gave him some pickups, you know. And I saw him at the NAMM show a couple months ago in Austin, Texas. And he's up on stage, and I guess he saw me. And he started telling the story about, you know, here I am, this little cocky kid. And I go in, I try to impress this guy at his booth, you know. And, and he started talking to me, and he said, "Try this, you know." And uh, and it was Mr. Seymour Duncan, you know. And, and I, I just felt so good about that, you know. And and, yeah. and that's what I, I wanted to do because I've had help from Leo Fender and Seth Lover who designed the Humbuck and Pickup, um, Bill Carson, the Fender. I used to write him letters every week, you know. When did the Jazzmaster uh, be developed? And 
what, what year was the first Telecaster? So I was asking all these questions about the history of guitars. When I was back in the 60s, when I was 14, 15 years old, and nobody was really cared about that stuff, you know. So I, I kept all these notes over the years, and then I started working for Vintage Guitar Magazine, and I started pulling out all these old papers that I had, and I had all these facts of when things were, were done. So I've always liked the history of it. I like repairing guitars and build, building things and making new modifications. And, and I'm, I'm still hands-on. Yeah, I wind, I hand wind all the pickups in the custom shop at our company in Santa Barbara. And uh, but I've been very fortunate, and I just really want to give back to these young kids to, to have them, you know, teach them to get their own tone and get out there and play. You know, which I think is so important. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I think you're doing that. In a I hope good way. so. I yeah. really want to. You know, yeah, I really want to. Yeah. And it's an interesting story as to how you got into actually making pickups. It wasn't something that you actually set out to do, was it? It's no, no. Not, I mean, there, there were no books written about it. Nobody knew, like on the East Coast, nobody knew what a guitar pickup was because all the guitars were made either in like Kalamazoo, Michigan, the Gibson Company, or Fullerton, Orange County, where Fender was being made. And that, that was a whole new thing on the East Coast when all these electric guitars were coming through. And then. Uh, I had some uh, country singer. I was doing a Sunday jam when I was about 16 years old, and uh, she needed a guitar. So everybody's like looking at me, and I said, "Oh no, man, she's gonna borrow my guitar." <laughs> so I let her use it, and she strummed so hard. She's used to it, like a Guild acoustic with like 12 to 56 strings. Well, I had eight inner banjos, which were like a nine, and she got the high E string lift under the bridge pickup of my Telecaster pickup. And the, the guitar string gouged into the coil and just like broke all the wire into the pickup. And so when I went to play it, it didn't work. And I was like, oh my god, what happened to my guitar? And it was a guitar that I got from Roy Buchanan. You know, one of his students, he got it for me and I paid like $40 for it, like a 56 Telecaster. And uh, so I took the pickup out and I went to school. I'm in class with a microscope and biology class and the teacher said, hey, what are you doing there? I said, oh, somebody broke my guitar and I'm trying to fix it. She says, well, come back after school, you know, and you can sit here, you can spend all the time you want. So I, I finally got it. My father helped me find some magnet wire. And uh, my first coil winder was a record player with a block of wood on it. And it would go 33 and a third RPMs or 45 or 78. And so that, that was my first winding machine. And so I started using that, and that was my quilt machine, you know. So I was, I was, I learned from the bare basics how to start playing with guitar. And when I wound it, I, there was like a line, a shadow on the bobbin, and so I wound the coil to that where the line was, and I forgot that that was where the string was to that outer point. So I actually put more turns on it. So my Telecaster, when I started playing it, it had a fatter sound, it had more sustain. I said, man, this is really cool, you know. So people were playing my Telecaster. Get that tone. How do you get it so fat sounding? I said, "Well, I, I rewound the, the bridge pickup on it, you know, and and uh, and that that was the whole start of it, you know. People were starting like they were messing with their pickups and they were breaking them. And they bring them to me and I start repairing them for them, you know. So then that, that was great. And then uh, I was on the road traveling and stuff. And then I ended up in London. And then I started working at uh, there was an ad in the paper. Uh, for a, a repairman for the Fender Soundhouse, you know, and I said, God, this is cool, man. Because I was recording during uh, the evening with a guy named Chris Harley, uh, Chris Rainbow, and he was a singer for Alan Parsons Project, and he did stuff with a band called Camel and John Anderson from Yes, and a br brilliant singer, harmonizer, just incredible, you know. And then I, I, I met up with a, um, a band called uh, Druick and LaRange, and Kurt LaRange, who's from for uh, Laurent, who's from uh, down here, and uh, so we, we've been friends for ever since the 70s, you know, 74, 75, we've been friends for 30 some years, you know, and, and so just meeting, you know, meeting other people from different countries was so cool for me when I went to England, because there'd be other guitar players there, I met Albert Lee, I met Jerry Donahue, uh, who was in the Hellcasters, he was playing with Joan Armitrady at the time, and uh, and then uh, Albert Lee was playing with head, hands, and feet, so just a brilliant guitar player. I started hearing all these uh, English guitar players, and then I, I made the Telly Gib, which I was like the guitar I was playing last night, and that's the one I made for Jeff Beck that he did on Blow by Blow called Man and His Lovers. You know, it was my first prototype JB. So having a chance to go over there, and I saw Paul Kossoff from the band Free, and I saw their last show that they did before they broke up. And Paul Kossoff, you know, all right now, man, that those chords, he's using an orange amplifier and everything. 
So I, I'd be watching him. I'd write down everything, what, what equipment he was using, what foot pedal, yeah. where his knobs were set on his uh -huh. amp. And I, I would just accumulate all this information from every, every guitar player I saw. And uh, I would write down stuff, you know, just trying to remember. I'd look at his guitar, you know, he'd play it. And I was working with Mark Bowen from T-Rex, uh -huh. and I took his guitar and had to fix that. And so all these guys, you know, Peter Green, his old guitar. I was working with Gary Moore and stuff over there. Uh, Wishbone Ash, uh, Robin Trower, who did Bridge of Size, you know. And so every guitar that came in at the Fender Soundhouse, man, I was just, I was taking specs, measuring everything. I bought calipers, measured how wide the nut was, and how high the strings were from the pick up and everything. So I just would accumulate all this information. And then when I came back to California in 76, uh, I just had all this information, the specs, and DC resistance of all these different pickups that I had worked on. So I started then repairing things. Um, remember uh, Radar Love? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was Bowneering. Bowneering. Yeah. That was one of the first pickups that I had uh, done when I was in England. You know, ah. it was for Bowneering when they did that song they were recording, and I was working with uh, oh, so, so many great you know English band Super Tramp. Ah. They were over there be before they came to, to the states and did Breakfast in America. And stuff. Mm -hmm. So all these people, I, and then I was touring with with uh, Drew and Larange, with Kurt Larange. And we traveled to Germany, and we did some shows over there and everything, and uh, we had the uh, drummer and bass player from uh, the Grease band, which was Joe Cocker's band. So it, for me, it was we had a great time. I mean, we're young, we're like 22, 23 years old, and we're just having the ball of our life, you know. And so when I came to the States, then I started doing rewinds, and then I, that's how I got into working on pickups, from, because I knew about it. And I saw a need for it because people were always messing with their guitars or refinishing the guitars and everything. And uh, so I just happened to get in there and just started, you know, really doing it. And then I did add in Guitar Player Magazine and, and the rest was history. And then in 78, like two years later after I started doing the rewinds, I started manufacturing like all the single coil pickups. And then I, I actually paid, bought a mold for the humbucking pickup, which is that really started you know, in the big league. You know, doing making all kinds of different pickups. Then I was doing stuff for Santana and uh, the cars. They would use the Duncan Custom, Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. All the all the hair bands that were starting to come yeah. out, man. We were like right in there. We were in LA and we were close to it. And we were doing all the stuff for Charvel and Jackson and, and all the custom shops that were down in LA, the Gibson Custom Shop and all the guys at Fender. I was doing stuff Fender Warranty. And then I went back to Gibson. And I was doing Gibson warranty, so I, I really I was doing all the electronic repairs. So I, it was it was just perfect situation, you know. And and uh, then we started making like five or seven pickups, and then it was 14 pickups, and now then it's like 20, and then 40, and then 50 different models of pickups, you know, for different colors, zebra or creams, and for the humbuckers, and then with covers. And so now we make like over 300 models of pickups, and I do the Troy Christians and. Um, all the like the Skips and Staple, the uh, uh, Armand Dynasonics, which are the, the ones with the quarter-inch magnets and the old Reds pickups and everything. So I just started making a lot of a lot of different models. You know, we do the Johnny Smith and the, uh, the Birdland. We can do pole spacing. We, we can make any kind of thing that we want, which is so cool right now. You know, so I'm, I'm very proud. But I love like coming here to Australia and uh, meeting you guys and, and um, seeing old friends. And making new ones, you know. I mean, you guys—it's so such a great place over here, you know. And uh, I was telling my rep, Stephen, that it would be nice to just have some land and just go camping. And I'm in amateur radio, and I I can put my antennas up somewhere out in the desert, you know. And and, and I like I like looking around. I collect rocks and everything, so I'm always having fun like that. Yeah. You know? So, but I really appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, being so gracious to me too. You know, I'm, I'm coming into it like a different country but everybody was so open arms to me and I appreciate that and having you having the chance to play with you and your friends last night was, yeah. was really great you know? yeah, well, I appreciate it, that it yeah. was a highlight for me you know oh, to, to meet great. Seymour yeah. you know, and, and play with Seymour yeah. that's a, that was a really wonderful yeah. thing for me that's cool it. Yeah. yeah so much too like people that they hear the name they don't know that I was yeah, even a guitar player that's right. you know? I, I didn't even know there was a you know a real person yeah, yeah. everybody just, thinks like yeah. you know you know Procter and Gamble or something. Yeah, some yeah, that's what I thought. You know? Yeah, that's what I thought. now I, I, I'm just me, and I started out. And now I have uh, my kids are actually involved, and Evan Scott, my marketing manager, yeah. and everything. He's he's great, and he's helps me when I'm on the road. He'll he'll 
tour with the band and, and teach them all the songs and everything. So when I come up and play, they they already know the stuff, which is really good, you know. And so having that and working with dominant music over here, it's just been splendid. I mean, really good. You know, it's been, been really exciting and, and meeting all the all the different guitar manufacturers around here too. And you're, you're brilliant people, you know. Yeah, yeah. And every they're enthusiasts. And, yeah, and every, yeah. everything. You know, they always talk about made in America. I said, you know what? It should be made in the world because there's so many great craftsmen all over the world yeah. that uh, help produce so many things. You know, and, and like a lot of my products. I mean, I get parts from here and there, and I put them together like a certain way to make a Seymour Duncan product. But I have to respect so many other people who are great machinists and great technicians and great guys who know how to finish guitars and. and uh, there's so many talented people in the music industry, and, and um, I think it's good for all of us. It makes all of us sound better too. You know, with the amplifiers you're building, or the guitars you're playing, or uh, you know, the strings I'm using, or something. You know, it's a, there's something in there that really helps us all play better, and, and I, I respect that. And it, there, it's like a universal thing, and, and music is like a universal language. And uh, you meet so many brilliant people. So, and all these these, these talented players out there that are watching, you know, and important for them to realize that they're going to be the Eddie Van Halen someday or the, the George Lynch's or maybe the Leo Fenders you know yeah. out there and it just takes time but just keep doing what your heart believes and, and do it from your heart don't do it thinking about you're gonna make a lot of money or something because it, you may someday but just take your time and just do a great job and make a product that you're proud of and, and find your help your friends and give the support and really help them with uh, uh, what the product is and, and, and teach them, educate them, you know, and that's, that's my, my whole philosophy, I think, is, you know, the future depends upon the echo of the past, yeah. and I've had so much help from Leo Fender and and all, all the great Ted McCarty and Gibson, all these guys would tell me things, you know, do this, you know, if you're going to make this, do this, and uh, I couldn't have done it without them, and so now I, I feel in my heart, no, it's for me to help you guys and whoever needs it suggestion or we could just talk about it and, and I learned stuff from guys you know making things like for a year you know you see something oh that's cool that's a good idea and everybody has their own working habits and I think for me that's, that's the way to, to do it and to really uh, grow grow with it.